So, um, welcome again to Sweat and Study. That's a very exciting looking drink. <laughs> I could, we kind of. It's all not that. It's actually juice. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> but it's juice in a really great bottle. <laughs> yeah. um, sure it is. Of course it is. <laughs> you could pass it around. Right. <laughs> you know, juice. Um, so again, uh, we're working with the Sati Patana Sutta, a wonderful text, sometimes called the Foundations of Mindfulness, um, and the translation that we're working with is a translation in this um, book called Sati Patana, the Direct Path to Realization, by this wonderful uh, Western monk, um, Analayo, who uh, studied in Sri Lanka, and he's a wonderful writer. This is actually his doctoral dissertation, so it's very inspiring to me getting my dissertation. Um, I don't think it'll be as good as this, but it's a very good, it's really one of the most clear and wonderful commentaries on this scripture. So I didn't have a required text for this workshop because the, the sutta itself is quite short. That's it, whole thing. Very nice. But, um, but the commentary in this, like he breaks down practically every word, if you're that kind of scholar and you really want to know, and you, and you really want to also, you know, have a very comprehensive guide for practice, um, totally recommended, right? Like John Stewart, I'll put it on the table, you know, facing the camera, there it is. And now we have our guest, everyone has, you know. All right, so the way we've been doing these, um, these studies is that we, we go around and we each kind of read a paragraph um, at a time. Um, and going on, we'll do it a little bit differently for this one because it's quite short and it's quite compact, so we'll want to pause after each paragraph and talk a little bit. But we'll read the text out loud, um, and then I'll say a little bit about that paragraph, and then we'll have a little discussion about it, and we'll move through it like that. Um, a general overview of this text is that um, it shows up um, as the um, the Buddha's teachings are are collected in. Um, in three major collections um, called pitaka, or baskets. It literally translates as, as baskets, so the three baskets. And those three baskets are called the suttas. A sutta is one, and sutra literally means thread. So the Pali word is sutta, S-U-T-T-A, and the Sanskrit word is sutra. Um, and the early Buddhist texts are written down in Pali, and the technical words here are, are written in Pali, so mostly I'll use the Pali version of the words. But for many of them, they have a, um, a Sanskrit parallel that we know better, like Nibbana is the Pali, but Nirvana that we've heard more of is the Sanskrit. So we'll, we'll say what those parallels are for some of them. So the, the Sutta Pitaka, the basket of, of suttas, or the basket of teachings, um, is substantial, 45 years worth of oral teachings given by the Buddha. And it's collected in several large volumes, of which this one is perhaps the most useful. It's the middle-length discourses called the Majima Nikaya. Nikaya is, um, is, means collection, in a way, the, the middle-length discourses. And there's the long discourses and the short discourses. They're organized by length. So these are all the ones of medium length. Um, <laughs> and they happen to be also ones that, that concern the meditative practices particularly. And for some reason, the long discourses, for instance, tend to contain more of the teachings for lay people that he would give, like in the towns. So that's interesting. But if you want to really dig into the Buddhist uh, original teachings, this is the one to get. And it's wonderful. Um, uh, I got it. I did sit down and read the whole thing. It's fairly repetitive, but parts of it deeply beautiful. Parts of it completely inscrutable as well. So full disclosure. And this sutta is number 10 in this collection. It also occurs in the long discourses, the Digha Nikaya, in a slightly longer form, uh, but essentially identical. All of the suttas, um, so the Sutta Pitaka is one of the baskets. The other two are the Vinaya, and the Vinaya is the monastic discipline, so all the rules for the community of monks and nuns. And it's quite voluminous itself, all the examples of how the rules came to be. It's rather Talmudic, in fact, um, to make a cross-cultural comparison. And then the third basket is called the Abhidhamma, or Abhidharma in Sanskrit. You don't have to remember that so much. That's the analytical uh, 
tradition, and it's mostly commentarial. It arose a few hundred years after the Buddha, but it contains um, a really detailed breakdown of kind of the implications of these teachings in terms of the cosmology, in terms of primarily inner psychology, kind of how it works. You know, lists like the 52 primary mental states, you know, and, you know, which ones are wholesome and which ones are unwholesome and how these work in this way. It's very, very detailed in that way. So the sutta or the sutras are the ones most often dealt with, I think, by lay practitioners in the West, certainly. And this is among the most used and most attended to of the suttas. Uh, the suttas range in subject all over the map. Lots of them on ethical teachings, lots of them different kinds of parables or metaphors for practice. Many of them that describe meditation practice as a deeply concentrated or focused practice called jhana. We'll talk about that a little later on. But by and large, they are mostly not about mindfulness. Um, even though that's an aspect of the Buddha's teaching that um, has really become central in the West. They, the teachings imply mindfulness throughout, but there are very few texts that address it directly as a practice, and this is really the, the pinnacle of that. It's the core text that does that. And interestingly, apparently in the chronology of the Buddha's life, this text was given fairly late. So the very first teaching he gives uh, he gives to five of his friends right after he's become um, awakened. And he teaches the Four Noble Truths. So the truth that there is suffering, the truth that there is a cause to that suffering, the truth that it's possible to be free of that suffering completely, which is what nirvana or nibbana is, and that there's a path to becoming free. So those four um, truths are the first thing he taught right away. And then he taught all sorts of things for 45 years that were basically an unfolding of those basic four. And this teaching comes fairly late. It's almost as if he taught all this other stuff and people were getting into it and deepening in the practice. And at some point he said, okay, I'm just going to lay out in a very systematic way specifically the meditative practices that I've been giving you. Um, and then he lays it out in this way. So then we get this beautiful text. All of the Buddha's teachings were given as oral tradition, and they were memorized for a few hundred years before they were ever written down. When they were written down, they were written down in this language called Pali, which is a dialect of Sanskrit, not really, a, not really ancestor to it. Sanskrit was around a long time before, but it was kind of a regional dialect, and the words sound fairly similar. So Pali, Nibbana, Sanskrit, Nirvana. Pali, Kama, Sanskrit, Karma. Um, Pali, Sati, which is a word we'll use a lot, Sanskrit smriti. And those of you who read the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras with me back in February, we talked about smriti, uh, meaning memory. And we'll talk a little bit about how the Sanskrit, this very common Sanskrit word for remember, becomes in the Buddha a very precise word meaning mindfulness. So the reason that we have all of them, certainly the mythical reason that we have all of these texts, is that they were all remembered verbatim by the Buddha's cousin, Ananda who became a monk some years after the Buddha began teaching. And uh, Ananda is this wonderful figure. I love him. Sarah loves him, too. Um, he was the Buddha's cousin. He became really enraptured with the Buddha and teachings, became a monk, um, and became the Buddha's attendant. Um, and upon becoming the Buddha's attendant, he, um, he gave a few stipulations. He agreed, the Buddha asked him to be his attendant, and he said, well, I will um, only if you will promise me these things. One, that you give me no favors whatsoever. Like, you don't treat me differently than any other monk. And if I need to be reprimanded, you reprimand me like any other monk. Right? And two, that you don't give me any special treats, like sleeping in your room or special food when you get special food. Like, he really made sure that he wouldn't be, kind of get preferential treatment. And then he said, and this is sort of the kicker, he said, and if you will repeat to me all of the, that I can be present for every discourse you give, and the ones that I'm not present for, you will repeat to me, if I wasn't there, and that you will repeat to me every discourse you ever gave before I showed up. <laughs> right. So he was a completist, right? He would say. 
you know, he's like the guy that collects every episode of Doctor Who from 1963 on. <laughs> oh my God, I missed one episode of John Pertwee in 1967. I gotta get it, right? Um, that was a partly an in-joke for Ben Wurgeft, uh, who loves Doctor Who, and it was a tiny window in, into Sean as a teenager at the age of 13 <laughs> with a collection of VHS tapes as long as the Sutta Pitaka on his bookshelf. Really, suffering has no bounds. So, um, so the Buddha agreed to all of these requests and he repeated for Ananda every discourse he had ever given until Ananda showed up and for his whole life spoke to Ananda every single discourse or Ananda was there. Ananda has, mythologically, um, a perfect memory. And after the Buddha dies, all of the high up monastics get together and, um, and they have a conference. And Ananda stands up in front of the conference and repeats from memory everything the Buddha ever said from the beginning. And the monks, right, oral tradition, fabulous memory, began to memorize it. And they memorize it verbatim for hundreds of years. And, and they read like oral tradition. So they're a little sing songy at times. And there's a lot of repetition. In these translations that we use nowadays, there's a lot of little ellipses, as in, you know, that same old paragraph again. So maybe a couple times we'll, we'll go back and read that paragraph. It's actually nice to read the, ellips the ellipses rather than just saying, yeah, 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 yeah. But to go back and read it again, because you get a sense of how these things were spoken and you remember them. If you say the same thing over and over again, you're going to remember it too. And we then joined this lineage of oral transmission of this text that's been going on for 2,600 years and shows no sign of slowing down. There are actually two monks in Burma right now that can repeat the entire Pali Canon. So all three baskets, of the, which is like a ton of words. It's like, you know, it's like 10 Bibles length of words, can repeat the whole thing from memory. They do it at hyperspeed in a kind of a sing-song chanting. And they're, they're, quite, they're quite lauded. They're quite respected um, in Burma. And they're teaching a couple of tiny little boys who have shown talent to do the same thing. Whoa. Yeah. So, um, so all the suttas begin with this beautiful line, thus have I heard. Right? It's kind of traditional. It's come down to us from the Victorians. Thus have I heard. And which means that what we're hearing is Ananda. So this is, this is the voice of the suttas at the very first Buddhist council. And Ananda stands up in front of the monastics and says, thus have I heard. I heard it this way. And everyone's saying, oh, I, I heard it from Ananda. Thus have I heard. This happened. Right? So Ananda becomes an object of devotion if you love these texts, because without that memory, we wouldn't have it. Right? So. There's other, maybe I'll tell other stories about Ananda as we go on. He's quite dear. But let's begin the text. So translation of the Sati Patana Sutta. We'll get into what each of those words mean. And let's just have a volunteer to read that first opening paragraph. Anahara. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country at a town of the Kurus named Kamasadana. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, venerable sir, they replied. The blessed one said this. Beautiful. So this is kind of the standard opening. Thus have I heard. It's the beginning of all the suttas. And then it tells you where it happened. So once the blessed one, a name for the Buddha, was living in the Kuru country at a town of the Kurus named Kamasadama. And you can look at the Buddhist texts. A lot of them were given in specific places. You know, the Buddha for a while lived in this place called the Squirrel Sanctuary. And there are all these texts that say the Buddha was living at the Squirrel Sanctuary. <laughs> or, you know, the Buddha was living in Jetta's Grove, Ananda Pindaka's Park. And this, that's this particular place that has a little story around it. You know, or was living at, at Deer Park. He gave his first teaching at, at Deer Park outside of Sarnath. He didn't give very many teachings at, at in the Kuru country at Kama Sadama. So not only is this text given late, but it's given in an odd place. And there's some stories about like, well, why did he give this text here? You know, who was there? And there's sort of stories about how that, how that happened. But um, anyway, it tells us where he was. And all the texts kind of start by just saying what happened. He says, hey, monks, bhikkhus is the word. Bhikkhu just means one who's left the lay life for the homeless life. And so 
um, translating it monks gives it a gendered spin, uh, which isn't complete, which is unknown as far as how specific it was. There was certainly a women's sangha at this time, and there may well have been women practitioners present. Uh, he always just said bhikkhus, but it meant everybody that was there. And everybody that was there in the Buddha's time meant what is called the fourfold sangha. And the fourfold sangha means ordained men, ordained women, lay men, and lay women. And so these kind of four classes of people are said to have been present at many of the teachings. So when, they, when he says monks, we can, uh, for all intents and purposes, assume that it means us. In other words, anyone practicing. So bhikkhus, those of you who have left home and have entered the, the path of rootlessness, or the path <coughs> of not relying on the illusion of stability of the home, but you've gone out to, to meet the world with no possessions, essentially. Right? So we can take this mythically to mean ourselves, or we could take it quite literally and orient ourselves toward the, the formal monastics who uh, really did that. So he begins with this um, thing that, said that Analayo uh, helpfully gives us little, little uh, labels for each paragraph. He begins with this statement of the direct path. So let's have someone read that next paragraph. the direct path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of dukkha and discontent, for acquiring the true method for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four Satipatthanas. Super. So, the Buddha, when he left home to practice, went out and studied with the teachers that were around at the time. And they were teachers from the, the Upanishadic yoga tradition. And they primarily taught forms of very intense concentration. And he learned what are called the jhanas, J-H-A-N-A, which are states of, of deeply focused attention and really absorbed attention in one thing. And this is a practice that's been uh, taught in yoga for a long time before the Buddha. Right? It, it goes way back into the yoga, to the yoga Upanishads and, and before that. Maybe one of the earliest places it shows up is just in the beginnings um, in the Katha Upanishad. If you want to look for the origins of meditation practice in yoga, you can look at the Katha. Um, and it, it shows uh, the beginnings of, of the internalization of the ritual practice of sacrifice. So rather than making offerings to the gods externally, directing the attention inwardly with inquiry and concentration to find out what's true. So the Buddha learns these very deep concentrations that he then teaches for his whole life. He takes on the yoga teaching that he learned. But he says that when he became enlightened, he used those practices to get him to a state where he could really be mindful. But then he discovered this practice of mindfulness that was not taught before. So this is really said to be, um, and you can get into history here, of course, it's said to be by the Buddhists who really think that their thing is special, that it's the thing that's unique to the Buddhist teachings, that it doesn't show up in early yoga. Um, of course, it's not black and white in that way. And there were a lot of teachers going around teaching a lot of things, and he was influenced by them. So um, however it showed up, this teaching of mindfulness shows up as a different kind of inquiry than just focused concentration. And then he makes this grand claim for it that it's the direct path. So it leads straight there. And then it leads to all these beautiful things. The purification of beings, the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of dukkha and discontent. Dukkha is the Pali and Sanskrit word that is at the heart of the first noble truth. The first noble truth is the truth of dukkha. And it's often translated as suffering, sometimes as stress, which is a slightly less maybe charged word than suffering. I like translating it sometimes as sorrow, even though it has a kind of sadness emotional tone. There's also a sense of just the poignancy of dukkha. Right? Dukkha, in a way, is everything dissatisfying. Right? Things that are dissatisfying because they're impermanent, dissatisfying because they're painful, dissatisfying because you want to have stability or certainty in your life, and there just isn't any. And so that's dukkha. And it's, it's, it goes from the very subtle to the very gross. 
So here he promises, this is the direct path for the disappearance of dukkha and discontent. For acquiring the true method, so through this practice, through this direct path, the true method or the way to liberation will be revealed or found. For the realization of nibbana, the making real of nibbana or nirvana, namely the four satipatthanas. Nibbana or nirvana literally means extinguishing and the early metaphor is of a flame that's gone out because its fuel has been exhausted. So it's sort of like, it's not like you destroyed anything. It's not like anything even disappeared. Where does the flame go? It's koan time, Zen koan. Where does the flame go when the candle is blown out? Right? Where does it go? It doesn't go anywhere, right? It's just done. And the conditions aren't there for the flame to still be going. When the candle burns down, there's no more wax, no more fuel, no more, can no more flame. Likewise, when there's no more source of suffering, right, which is the second noble truth, the source of suffering is clinging, really grasping on to wishing things were a certain way. Oh, the pleasant stuff I want, I'll hold on to it. Don't make it end. Oops, it ended. You know, the stuff I don't like, the painful stuff, make it go away, make it stop. Oh, it's not stopping, right? That kind of grabbing onto how I want things to be, dukkha. Uh, it's called, called tanha in, in the Four Noble Truths. So that's the fuel, right? When you're done with that fuel, when you're done with grasping, the flame goes out, right? No more dukkha. So um, another literal translation for nibbana is that which is unbound. This one's is a translation used by a monk that I like a lot, Tanisaro Bhikkhu down in San Diego. Unbound. So that, the flame was bound to its fuel before, and it's unbound. It like returns to where? To, I don't know, nothingness, out, right? You could get cosmological. Where does it go? It's unbound. Namely, the four satipatthanas. And then a last little bit of etymology, satipatthana. So this translation, and I like that he does it, he just uses the word, he uses the Pali word, satipatthana. Um, other translations, like the one in here, this is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation of the Middle Length Discourses, Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli. And Bhikkhu just means, right, monk or beggar, often a prefix to a monk's name. And he uses what we kind of inherited from the Victorians, um, the foundations of mindfulness. And there's, um, there's a little etymological uh, um, disagreement around what the patana part of satipatthana means. The, the commentaries, um, so again, this gets a little Talmudic. I'll try not to spend too much time here. But the, t the, the commentaries derive patana from, um, from the word for, for ground or foundation, like the foundation of your house. So these four foundations of mindfulness, it's basically divided into four kind of chunks of things you might pay attention to, are considered like you know, the foundation of paying attention. It's a reasonable interpretation. And that's how they're usually taught. That's how I was taught them. They're the foundations of mindfulness. They're the sort of building blocks of mindfulness. Um, Analayo comes in and says, well, not actually, not exactly. And he, um, uh, let me see if I can get, give you his exact quote. Um, okay, here we go. So um, he says the Pali term upatana literally means placing near and refers to a way of being present and attending to something with mindfulness. And that the commentaries actually derive it from a different word, patana, foundation or cause. And then he goes through all the, the sort of, you know, reasons why that shouldn't be the right thing. When, the, when that term is used in other discourses, it means this, and goes through a whole thing. To say that calling it a foundation makes it, in a way, like, it be how I would say it is, like, makes it a little less intimate. Like, oh, it's a building block. Well, that's nice. But it's a way to bring near is the translation that he's preferring. So it might be a, a subtle detail, 
but um, I actually quite like it. And then, and then he just doesn't translate the word. Um, so rather than calling it a foundation of mindfulness, um, another translator calls, it, calls them frames of reference. So there's a lot of ways to translate the word. He just calls them satipatthanas. So we'll just, we'll just use that. And then the word sati is the important word here. So sati is the Pali version of the Sanskrit word smriti, S-M-R-T-I, with a little dot under the R. And smriti is the Sanskrit word, as I said, that means memory. It, and it literally just means remembering. Oh, I had a memory of my childhood. I had a smriti of my childhood. The Buddha takes it on, and, and it becomes something like not just memory in general, but, but remembering the object of meditation, or in a way, remembering the present moment. Almost like, like, oh, I forgot to be present, and then I remembered. So there's this way that it's the aspect of remembering where you bring your attention to something. So, oh, I bring my attention to the present. I was lost in thought, thinking about dinner, thinking about a party later on. Ooh, I'm here now. I feel my body. I remember. And of course, the English word, we like it a lot, remember, to bring back together. So sati, oh, remember where you are. Right? And Jack Kornfield, uh, my teacher, says this a lot. He says, remember who you really are. Remember who you really are. In a way, he's just saying, be mindful right, of being. Be mindful of who you are. So sati then becomes, from remember, it becomes this very specific, like, re don't remember the past. Remember the present. Remember where you are now. And then everything unfolds from there. So sati is this beautiful word in that way. Any questions so far? There's a little intro. We've gotten two paragraphs in. We're doing great. Anything so far? Kind of the framing or the <laughs> setup. All right, excellent. So the sutta is divided into four big chunks. The first one is the chunk um, around uh, mindfulness of the body. And as we get into it, first he gives you a definition of mindfulness. So let's have someone read that for that third paragraph, nice and kind of loud and clear for everyone. Sure. Sure. What are the four cue marks in regard to the body? A monk abides cont contemplating the body, diligent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. In regard to feelings, he abides contemplating feelings, diligent, clearly knowing, and mindful free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. In regard to the mind, he abides contemplating the mind, diligent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. In regard to dhammas, he abides contemplating dhammas, diligent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. Wonderful. So these are the four categories we'll look at, so I won't define them much now. We'll get into them as we're in as we're in there. The first one is body, with regard to the body. He, and I, again, I'll apologize for the, the singularity of the gendered pronoun in this text. Um, and let's just take it that it means all of us. Um, and we can change it and while we can, reading it. While you're reading it, body. change it all. The, I change them all the time, just randomly. Say he, she, they, whatever you want. You can use complicated postmodern pronouns, you know, <laughs> H-I-R, um, S slash H E, you know, <laughs> which I use all the time. I actually like that one very much. Um, so, uh, so uh, body. The second one, feelings, which doesn't mean emotions, uh, but we'll get into that. It means pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. The third one, uh, mind, and the fourth one, dhammas. And uh, this is dhammas in its meaning, like things or things to pay attention to, and just set that aside for now, and we'll totally dig. It's the fourth foundation of mindfulness, which is the biggest of them, and fairly complex. We'll dig into it in a couple weeks when we get there. The thing you want to really grok in this opening definition is the sentence that gets repeated over and over. It's, it's repeated because he wants you to really know it. Diligent, clearly knowing and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. This is basically like Practice in this way. Whatever you do, whether you're attending to this or that or this or that, do it all of it this way. So first, three qualities, right? Diligent, clearly knowing, 
and mindful. These are three complementary qualities. Um, I kind of grew up with this, grew up, you know, over the last 10 years anyway, with this translation. And so I just want to read um, the one that I'm used to uh, because uh, I like it also. I'll read just the beginning of the paragraph. What are the four? Here bhikkhus, a bhikkhu abides, contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. So I have to say that on a poetic side, I'm a little more with Bhikkhu Bodhi than Analayo here, mostly because I like this word ardent. So the Pali word that's being translated as the first of these qualities is atapi, um, A-T-A-P-I, with, long, with longs over the A's, atapi. And atapi as a word is related to the Sanskrit word tapas. So those of you that, that know um, the Eight Limbs of Yoga from Patanjali or the earlier yogas from the Upanishads, tapas, um, tapas means what? What's tapasya? Heat. heat, literally heat, yeah. And in the early, early yogas, yoga generating heat in the body, and later, the later hatha yogins, a couple thousand years after this, would say, oh, heat, we can do that. <laughs> and come up with all sorts of good, hard <laughs> things to do. I'll hold my breath for a minute till I get turned blue or red, and then I'll do all this hard stuff to generate heat in the body. And that heat was said to do a lot of things, to burn up impurities, right? Anyone who does hot vinyasa classes knows that it feels like it does that, right? Get some heat going, right? Get your sweat going. That's why we sweat first when we study. Tapas also refers to ascetic practices. So the practices of, um, of mortification. You'll still see bhikkhus do this in India, hold one hand aloft for 10 years until it totally withers. That's a serious tapas practice. I don't know really what it does, because I don't know anyone that practices that, um, but it's a very, very old practice. And the Buddha did these practices before he woke up. He did these practices where he barely ate anything, practically died, experienced all the excruciating pains possible to experience, he said. And he figured out that those practices don't actually lead to much that was useful. He said, wow. I have done this, this mortification practice as fully as anyone. I'm near death, and they have not led me to happiness. And it was the turning away from tapasya as, as the mortifications that led him to what he called the middle way between extreme physical mortification and extreme indulgence. So he started off with indulgence, right? Born as a prince, lots of royalty, all the comforts of, of possible of his time. He went all the way the other way to the deepest mortification and almost died. And he came out saying, maybe there's something in the middle. <laughs> maybe, just maybe. Right? I could be a little more balanced here. And, and, then as, and then he went into his practice through the doorway of pleasure, which is great because it means that pleasure itself is not the same as indulgence. Right? Indulgence in his, in his worldly life was was food and comfort and houses and sex and music and all the luxuries that uh, the royal life could give at that time, right? And, and asceticism was the most painful things you could possibly do in the forest and almost die. Halfway in the middle was a practice that many of us would still consider fairly extreme. He sat down under the tree. He said, I will not get up until I'm free. Fairly rigorous practice. And for many of us, that would be an intense tapas. Right. When I was in Burma, I went to see my teacher. He said, you know, I had all this experience. You know, I'm just sitting, I'm doing this and that. He said, how's your setting? Oh, it's pretty good. How long do you sit? Oh, I can sit for about an hour. How's the pain? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. He said, oh, sit two hours. It's okay. Whew. All right. I never sat two hours before. I went back. Looked at the clock. All right, I'm going to do this. I generated a tapi, some tapas, some fire. Okay, I'm going to do it. I sat for two hours. Right? I can sit for two hours. It hurts after a while. Ooh, my knees, my hips. Okay, but I did it. I went back to him. You know, how's your practice? You know, and I have stuff to tell. He's like, how long you sit? So I always sit two hours. Um, how's the pain? Uh, you know, it got kind of painful. But, you know, <laughs> I could be mindful of it. I'm mindful of this and that here. You know, I could just sit three hours. <laughs> like, dude. <laughs> you know, one of our teachers, Joseph Goldstein, who helped found this tradition in the West, was told once by his, his teacher, Deepa Ma, who was really fierce. Incredible, incredible uh, woman. Wow, you want tapas? Like Deepa Ma, super devoted, passionate, incredible meditator. 
one day she says to Joseph, she says, mm, your practice is coming along. I think it's time for you to, to do a day-long sitting. And she doesn't mean a day-long retreat with some sitting and some walking and some mindful eating. She means sit for 24 hours. And he kind of laughed. He was like, eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> and she And she's just smiled. He says, totally sweetly. She says, don't be lazy. <laughs> so there you go, tapas. Um, so atapi, um, analayo translates it as diligent. In other words, stick with your practice. Don't fall off. Right? Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it as ardent, which I like very much, because it means get a little passionate about it. And for me, really, this means if you're going to keep practicing, because practice gets hard, you've got to have a little fire. You've got to have a little fire in the belly. Right? And even more ardent, you have to love it. And I don't know if atapi meant get passionate about practice to the Buddha, but I have to assume that it must have. He was clearly passionate about it. Nobody would have sat through that kind of practice, through what it takes to really like go all the way without serious fire and passion for waking up. So he had it, atapi. So he recommends it. It's the first of the qualities you gotta have, diligent, ardent, right? Perseverance, get in there, with your passion for, for waking up for freedom. Diligent, clearly knowing and mindful. So two other qualities. Clearly knowing basically means um, it's, it's not exactly the same as mindfulness. Clearly knowing really, and, and Bhikkhu Bodhi um, translates it as fully aware, which I also like. It's a little bit like don't miss anything. You know? And when you're attending to something, know it clearly. So I'm seeing the little flickering LED lights. Like, <laughs> that's what they are, you know. The little flickering fake candles. Know them clearly, right? So no fog in the mind. I see exactly what I see, the shape, the lights, the flickering. I know what's happening. Clearly aware of them, right? And the word clear shows up a lot, right? It shows up in the word vipassana. See clearly, seeing clearly. Clear, clear, right? There's something that the Buddha seems like he, he really said over and over was at the heart of this process of being free, which was actually not being deluded about what's actually happening, right? Seeing clearly what's happening moment to moment. So, you know, if I'm sitting here and what I think is happening is that I'm the great teacher giving a profound discourse and my students are looking at me with a rapt, adoring gaze, I might not be seeing completely clearly what's happening, right? <laughs> I might be caught up in what, we're, what we call, you know, a samskara, sankara. Um, a mental formation, a heavy thought, a, you know, a big old ego thought that is getting in my way of seeing clearly. It's a veil between me and what's actually happening. So mindfulness says, eh, watch out for getting all deluded. What's actually happening? It's like, oh, well, I'm seeing things, I'm hearing things, there's these sensations. Okay, right. So see clearly, fully aware, and then mindful. Remember what you're doing. So those three qualities, and then the, the kicker, the last one, it's sort of like you're supposed to practice this even though it sounds like a fruit of practice, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. When Analayo says it as free from, I almost feel like, well, I'm not free from them yet. How can I do that? But Bhikkhu Bodhi says it a little bit more like a practice, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. It's a little bit like when I'm going to do the formal practice of mindfulness, I intentionally set aside my grief and my discontent. It's not gone. I'm not the Buddha yet. But I'm going to set it aside. And one of the ways that, I, that, I can, that I'll practice with this is like, OK, part of mindfulness then is don't complain. right? Like, stop complaining for a minute about the world. <laughs> I'm going to set aside my grief and my covetousness, what am I grieving for, my wanting. Hey, OK, stop complaining about things and just attend to them. It doesn't mean I'm free from those desires. They're right there, right? Monkey on my back. But they're not driving the bus for the moment, right? In order to do that setting aside might take significant atapi, might take some significant fire. So then, you know, that's what's required. That's why I think diligent or ardent is the first quality. You need it to do all the others. And then the others are the supporting thing. More, any other questions on this?